Podcast. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. This is another special Wednesday morning episode brought to you by our new sponsor, Jeremy Clevenger Fitness, who we featured on episode 145. Now, if you haven't heard that episode yet, I encourage you to take a listen, especially if you're struggling to get and stay in shape as a busy leader. Also, if you haven't watched these uh, podcast interviews on video yet, I encourage you to give it a try. We have a growing following now on our YouTube page, so head on over there and check it out. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I have another great show lined up for you today, but before we get started, I just want to remind you to take a look at the leadership books on my website. I've written three leadership books, and I recommend you start with Eye of the Watch first. It's filled with 22 short stories that will help you become a leader worth following. It's a quick read, and most people finish it in less than three hours. It's also available in Kindle and on Audible, so you can listen in the car or while working out. So check out all my books on Amazon or on my website, johnsrenny.com. Well, that is it. Today we're going to be talking about the 80s. Specifically, what leadership lessons can we learn from 80s pop culture? And my guest is Chris Clues. Chris is the author of the ultimate series on essential work and life lessons from 80s pop culture. Now he's going to share us some leadership lessons uh, that we can learn from the decade that brought us Ghostbusters, Beverly Hill Cop, Thriller, The Walkman, and Parachute Pants. Now this was a fun episode that I I know you're going to love. So are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Chris Clues. Chris is a keynote speaker and author of the Ultimate Series on Essential Work and Life Lessons from 80s Pop Culture. Growing up in the 80s and with over 20 years of experience in corporate marketing, he knew three things very well, 80s pop culture, business, and this crazy thing we call life. He uses this knowledge to help audiences learn, laugh, and discover valuable lessons they can take back to their organizations. And I am excited to have Chris join us today to talk about the lessons we can learn from the 80s. So, Chris, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thanks, John. I appreciate it. I just want to, again, point out, I really appreciate the opportunity you know, I, I, guys like you, uh, guys and gals like you that, that have these podcasts that give people like me a voice, I truly, truly appreciate it because I know the work that goes into it. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, I'm just honored to have you on the show. When I saw when I saw your material and what you do, I said, well, I've got to have you on the show. It's the most unique. Uh, and I, I like to see unique um, angles that people take. Uh, especially, you know, teaching leadership and using different ways to teach leadership. And kind of the the idea of the 80s is very interesting to me. So I'm excited to talk about it. And for those who are not watching on YouTube, again, you got to subscribe to the YouTube channel because you get to see Chris. He's actually in a blockbuster uh, location right now as we're as we're doing this uh, uh, (laughs) recording. So you got to see it live. If you haven't seen it on YouTube, you know, go there and subscribe. Audio is great, but you got to see it on video too. So, well, Chris, give us a little bit of your background. How did you go from 22 years working in, you know, working on uh, global brands, doing marketing for global brands to become an author, speaker, and this 80s pop culture expert? Yeah. And for those of you, again, that aren't watching, I'm at the return bin. So if you're looking for one of the new releases, (laughs) I'm waiting for them to come in. Just let me know what you're looking for. Uh, Yeah. So I was, you know, in the corporate world, uh, 20 plus years, as you mentioned, and I, I really enjoyed marketing. That's what I did as, as you know, marketing leadership throughout the years. I uh, really enjoyed it, but I, I felt like there was something else out there for me. And I was kind of feeling stagnant in, in my career, which I'm sure we've all felt at some point in a job that just wasn't working out for me. And I was having a self-pity party of one uh, on my couch, as I tend to do, uh, watching The Breakfast Club. Uh, for the hundredth time or so. (laughs) And so I know all the lines in the breakfast club, but there was one line that I had heard, but I hadn't really listened to. And this day I I really listened to it and it was screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. And Bender says that when he's taking the screws out of the door and principal Vern is like, Hey, who took the screws out of the door? And he says, screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. I sat straight up. I said, I'm in an imperfect place. My screws have fallen out. 
what am I going to do to put those screws back in? Am I going to put the same screws in and keep walking down this path that, you know, I'm, I'm content, but you know, as Henry David Thoreau said back in the day, not an eighties pop culture icon, you know, the mass of men or the mass of people lead lives of quiet desperation. Was I going to continue down that path of quiet desperation or was going to look for something more? And I decided that I was going to get a whole new set of screws, a whole new door and a whole new door frame and walk out to an entirely new journey. I just didn't know what it was. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I was watching the outsiders and Johnny Cade says, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. Hmm. And I was 46, 47 at the time, not a 25 year old entrepreneur. And I thought I do still have a lot of time to make myself be what I want. And so I took this idea of screws falling out. I wrote an article on LinkedIn about what the breakfast club can teach us about problem solving and people really responded to it. So I decided to write a little book. I got a friend who's really good at graphic design. He helped me do it. We figured out how to self-publish it. I took movies from the eighties and I thought, what can we learn from them? Different movies like stand by me, the Goonies. And I found these lessons in the quotes from the movies, not really expecting anything to come of it. And it took off. Uh, people started mm -hmm. buying the book that I didn't know. And so I built a website. I positioned myself as a speaker because I, I enjoy talking as you can tell. And, um, I positioned myself as a speaker. I got hired as a speaker on this idea of lessons from 80s pop culture. I wrote a second book with the help of a publisher. And then at that point, I left the corporate world. I had my third book that just released. And I'm here in front of you today as a keynote speaker and author on lessons from 80s pop culture. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny because I, when I hear journeys like this, I always it's always the same story. Like it's sort of an unexpected turn, you know, like for you, you hear a line from a movie and next thing you know, it sort of motivates you to go in a direction that you never expected. Like I, I imagine, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't, didn't think you would be in this role today. Right. You know, I did not. Uh, absolutely not. I mean, I, you know, I was in the airport one time and I always wear funky vans. I design these really funky vans online that I wear on stage. I call them my stage shoes, but I'll wear them when I'm in the airport because they're, you know, people will say, Hey, cool shoes or whatever. And I, I was sitting next to a guy and of course he said, Hey, those shoes are pretty awesome. I said, thanks. They're my stage shoes. And he said, stage shoes. And I got into what I do. And I said, yeah. And I said, I, you know, I talk about eighties pop culture for a living. He said, how the hell did you get that gig? <laughs> And I knew at that moment that I had something that other people wanted to do. And that was a really exciting, proud moment for me to know that I had built something that other people would be intrigued and interested in. It's pretty cool. That is very cool. <laughs> so what is it about the 80s that's so appealing to audiences? You wrote this book, it takes off, uh, and you become a speaker and people want to have you talk about it. What is it about the 80s that it, it sort of attracts this attention and gets this, um, I don't know, just... Uh, nostalgia, I guess, is the best way to say. Yeah. So it's really interesting because 80s pop culture, if you, if you probably noticed, is getting stronger and stronger, this resurgence mm. that we're having. And really, nostalgia comes in 30-year cycles, mm. typically. We're 42 years removed from 1980, and it's only getting stronger. There's more and more things happening from the 80s. And I think a lot of it is because I talk about the idea of you know, 80s pop culture was kind of like a, a glitter bomb. Somebody took a glitter bomb, they threw it against the wall, all these wonderful colors came out. And that was all the different types of 80s pop, 80s pop culture, music, movies, um, television. I think there was a lot of experimentation going on, mm. something that we're lacking today. And when I speak to audiences, the two groups that come up to me the most, of course, are Gen X, which you would expect. Uh, and then the people in their 20s, I guess we call them Gen Z. They're fascinated by 80s pop culture yeah. because of Stranger Things and Cobra Kai and, of course, the you know the Top Gun sequel, which had them going back to watch the old Top Gun. Um, so we've had this resurgence, and I think a lot of it has to do with it was the last decade where I feel like pop culture wasn't manufactured. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is we got into the mid-90s, late 90s, and they started creating pop culture in a lab, I feel like, a little bit. And they would throw it out there and they would say, all right, we spent a lot of money on this, so we're going to hammer you over the head until you like it. Yeah. In the 80s, they kind of said, they threw it out there and said, do you like this? We're like, yeah, we like it. Okay, we'll make more of it. Do you like it? No, not so much. All right, let's go back and we'll try something else. We've lost that. I hope that we get that back, but I feel like that's part of the, 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 way, the reason that people are going back to the 80s so much. Yeah, I think you're right. I, you mentioned Stranger Things. That's the one thing that was appealing to me was all the, the you know, the first season especially was all these references to the movies, the music and, and you know, and I put myself in like, oh, I was this age when this took place, you know, and, and you know, it just really, really was neat to see 
you know, all that kind of played out in, in that show. And I think that's what you're right. That's why it was popular for different ages, like yeah. guys like myself who remember when Jaws came out and, you know, and ones for who were, you know, being, you know, or, or seeing it for the first time in some cases. So re- really interesting. And, and um, yeah. when you, you know, um, so you, you initially went on this, uh, you know, you looked at the breakfast club, you look at some other movies. Um, when did you say that, that, Hey, the eighties is just this treasure trove of, of lessons. When did you sort of figure that out? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm um, just going back real quickly to what you were talking about with why the eighties, right? I want to just touch on one more thing. And it's yeah. you, when you brought up stranger things. So let's say that a kid hears a song, pretty in pink in stranger things and they they go into google pretty in pink and they see that it's a song but then it says oh if you like this you might like these songs by the cure and the smiths and depeche mode and all this stuff and yeah. then oh did you know pretty in pink's a movie oh really it's a movie and did you know that that guy who did that movie did these movies 16 candles and weird science and plain trains on wheels and ferris bueller and breakfast club they can they can become an 80s pop culture expert in 30 seconds whereas you and i if we wanted to know about hey what's led zeppelin when I was 13 years old, I had to go ask the guy who's sitting on the Camaro smoking a cigarette with the Led Zeppelin That's patch and right. jeans jacket. Yeah. I'm not doing that. So I think there's a lot more access as well to information, which is why, you know, there's this opportunity for really to take off. Um, so going back to your question, you know, it's the quotes. And so people ask me like, how do you do this? And I say, I honestly, like I find a movie that I really enjoy. And then I just start looking at the quotes. I'll rewatch mm. the movie. I'll look on IMDb and a quote will jump out at me and I'll say, I think there's a lesson in that quote. Yeah. Uh, or I think there's a lesson in that, that scene. And then that's how I build it. Really, honestly, that's, mm. that's what I do. Uh, that's really interesting. That, and, I, and, I, and I see that as well, too. So it's, it's really neat to see that. So um, what are some of your favorite uh, workplace lessons that you teach using this, this 80s as a backdrop? And I know we're going to get into a few, so I'll save yeah. those, of course. But um, I'll talk about one. You mentioned unexpected at the beginning of our conversation, you know, this mm. unexpected path. And I, I often say that the best lessons in life and workplace in our workplace are going to come from the most unexpected of places uh, and people. And so to give you an example, uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Now, not a movie that you would look back on and say, wow, that can teach me an awful lot about my <laughs> workplace and workplace culture, but it actually can. And I when I was 12, I think I, I bought a ticket to ET and I snuck into fast times back when you could still actually sneak into the yep. other movie theater. You had to hide from the ushers with the flashlights, of course, but you know, we were able to do that. Uh, Jeff Spicoli. And if you know the movie, fast times, Regiment high, the stoner surfer dude, Jeff Spicoli, one of the great character cinematic characters of all time, not a guy you'd expect to learn a workplace culture lesson from, but he teaches us a lot. It's his relationship with Mr. Hand, the American history teacher who, I think as kids, we all thought, "What? A, yeah, I hate that teacher. I have a teacher like that. And as adults, we think that guy was a great teacher. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and I think the same thing with Principal Vernon in The Breakfast Club. We hate him as a kid. We love him as an adult. And so uh, Mr. Hand and, and Spicoli have this really interesting relationship. And that Spicoli's always late to class and Mr. Hand hates tardiness. And so there's this one moment where Mr. Hand finally just throws his hands up and says, why are you always late to my class? And Spicoli says, I don't know. And Mr. Hand says, you know, I like that. I don't know. And he takes the three words of Spicoli, he puts it on the chalkboard and he says, I'm going to leave this up here for all my classes to see, giving you full credit. Of course, Mr. Spicoli, which Spicoli says, well, this is awesome. I'm getting credit for something. So I asked this question about how many of you have been asked a question in the workplace and you didn't know the answer. Mm. And if you say, well, never, well, then in the words of the church lady, even it's strict in that special. <laughs> but for the rest of us, We've all been in that position. And back in the day, we were told it's a sign of weakness and vulnerability yeah. to say, I don't know. How, how could you not know the answer to every single question about your job? And so what happens? People make things up. Mm. This is not good, particularly if you're in a compliant and regulatory industry like pharmaceuticals, financial yeah, yeah. services. You're going to get in trouble. You can get your company in trouble. Just people are going to catch you in those lies or those things yeah. that you've made up. Yeah. So I say that saying, I don't know, is a sign of strength, transparent, honesty, and transparency. It is. Yeah. To say that I don't know, to admit that you don't know, the sign of strength, honesty, and transparency, something we need a lot more of in today's world. Now, I want to caveat it by saying that you want to say, I'll get back to you. Let me get the yeah. answer for you. Uh, yeah. Because as Seinfeld said to George in an episode of Seinfeld, George said, you know, I'm going to tell this girl that I love her. And he says, are you sure? Are you sure you're going to get the return? I love you. 
And he says, because if you don't, that's a pretty big matzo ball hanging out there. And so you want to make sure to caveat it with, an, you know, let me get the answer. You don't just want to leave the I don't know out there, but it's a sign of strength, confidence, and character. That makes a lot of sense. That 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 never even thought of it that way, but it's fantastic. Yeah, it's something we taught learned in the military. You never answered a question unless you knew. And if you didn't know, you said, "I don't know, but I'll find out." You know, and and yeah. that's that's something I learned too early on. But you're right. It's it's a, it's about being honest and, and and being transparent. That you know, in, in fact, as leaders, we don't know everything. Here, you know, here's a newsflash, leaders. <laughs> you don't know that's right. everything. We don't. <laughs> so, that's right. We don't. Uh, so I was just kind of kind of hits hit you with some of the stories that I saw on your website. So Ferris Bueller, right? We and you're wearing the shirt. I see that. Yeah. Um <laughs> what, how does how, what can Ferris Bueller teach us about work-life balance? Yeah, and I wore this shirt with Cameron on it because um, you know, I'll try to kind of machine gun these lessons for you as, as far as we go through. We'll go through them pretty quickly to get through as many as we can. So Ferris Bueller, obviously work-life balance being a big part of the the movie itself. He takes the day off from school. We all know this, hopefully know the story of Ferris taking that day off. And so we see the work-life balance or school-life balance, very important, obviously. But there's something deeper, and it's why I wore the Cameron shirt. Cameron is Ferris's best friend, and Ferris and Sloan, uh, Ferris's girlfriend, are the most optimistic and positive people you could ever want to meet. Cameron is the exact opposite, so pessimistic that Ferris says at the beginning, when Cameron gets to college, if he doesn't loosen up, his roommate's going to kill him. So he's so wound so tight. And we find out the at, at the end why. It's his relationship with his father that he needs to get through. But Ferris and Sloan look past this and they think, you know, we spent all this time planning this day off. And we see they spent a lot of time doing it. But they know that Cameron needs it more than them. And so they're willing to sacrifice this day, potentially, that it ends up being a miserable day. Because they realize that Cameron, their friend, needs it more than they do. Mm. And when we help a friend, we help ourselves in the process. We all have these Camerons in our life who just need some time away. Maybe it's a lunch. Maybe it's a breakfast. Maybe it's an entire day. But we all have those Camerons that need that time. And it's so important that we recognize that and recognize that it's not about us. It's not about our day off. It's about our friend's day off, that Cameron in our life. And I think we I think we miss that in the movie. We miss that lesson. We talk about the work-life balance and the school-life balance, but it's actually what he did for his best friend and how important that lesson is to all of us. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them. Best-selling leadership author John S. Rennie knows this. That's why he's written a new book called You Have the Watch. It's a guided journal for leaders designed to take you through an entire year of leadership training. By the end of the year, you will master 50 of the most important leadership skills. If you want to have a greater impact on the results and people in your organization, go to youhavethewatch.com and pick up your copy today. This podcast is brought to you by Jeremy Clevenger Fitness. As a high-performing leader, you know that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about leading by example. And for most people, the one area they are lacking when it comes to leading by example is their health and fitness. By improving your health and fitness, every other area of your life improves. But how do you get and stay fit as a busy leader? Well, you do what you've always done. You hire the best person for the job. Now, don't struggle on your own. Put Jeremy Clevenger on your team. Jeremy will work with you to help take your physique, mindset, nutritional habits, and more to the next level with his step-by-step, all-inclusive coaching program. Now, I've worked with Jeremy for the past year, and I'm in the best shape of my life. So if you want to step up your game reach out to Jeremy at jeremyclevengerfitness.com to find out more and get your initial consultation scheduled with him today. This episode is brought to you by the Fraternity of Excellence. The Fraternity of Excellence is an online and real-world community for men who are looking to improve in all areas of their lives. The men of FOE are working together to become better husbands, fathers, and leaders at work and in their communities. They live by a simple philosophy, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I've been a member for more than three years, and for me, I finally found a brotherhood of men that I was missing from my time in the military. Now, I love being around guys who are dedicated to becoming a better version of themselves. So if you're interested in becoming a man of excellence as well, go to fraternityofexcellence.com, or you can reach out directly to me to learn more. 
All I can think of is the Ferrari trying to roll back the uh, odometer. Yeah. That's 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 the scene that I think everyone remembers them from that movie. <laughs> yeah, and that's the that's the key scene because at that point, you know, Cameron goes underwater and like he's going to drown, but then he says, you know, Ferris Bueller, you're my hero. Yeah, and yeah. He's, and this whole thing leads to what Cameron recognizing, hey, I have this relationship with my father, I need to figure out because Ferris says, I'll talk to your dad, I'll take responsibility, and Cameron says, no, no. For the first time, I need to step up. Yeah. I need to take responsibility and I need to have this conversation. And that's all because they took him on that day off. I love it. I yeah. love it. All right, I'll give you another one. So um, Prince Akeem, uh, Coming to America. By the way, they made us a, a two version recently, which was interesting. But uh, Coming to America, what can that teach us about leadership? I usually love sequels when they bring the original cast back. That was not a good sequel. <laughs> I, I still love the original. It's one of the, it's probably the great romantic comedy and people forget that it is a romantic comedy. It is yeah. a rom-com. And I think it's probably the perfect rom-com in my opinion. And Prince Akeem is my number one profile in leadership and characters in eighties movies. And one of the reasons why is that when we meet him, he's the prince in the country of Zamunda. He's the heir to the throne. Everybody just wants to please him. And we see this when they're introducing him to his potential bride, but he wants to know more about her. What do you like? And she says, whatever you like. What kind of food do you like? Whatever food do you like? What kind of music do you like? Whatever music. He doesn't like this. He wants somebody to be their own person. And he wants somebody to love him for him. And he realizes, I'm not going to get this in my own country. They know me. I have to go somewhere else. He goes to Queens, New York to find his queen. We can have a conversation about whether, <laughs> you know, Queens, New York was the best place to find his queen, but this is where he goes. And, uh, and so he and his friend, Semi, and he strips everything away. Of, of that would recognize him as a prince where people would recognize him as a prince. And he takes an entry level job at a fast food restaurant, McDowell's. And there's this throwaway line. Again, one that people don't remember when you think of garbage, think of Akeem. Mm. This is what he says. And he's so proud of this moment of, of sweeping the floors and having this entry level job. And when I present, I have this great slide of Prince Akeem as, you know, in McDowell's with his broom, so happy. And then Prince Akeem and all his royal garb and how easy it would have been for him to just keep that, that princely occupation. But he didn't want that. He wanted something more. And what he teaches us is that unearned leadership creates pleasers and earned leadership creates believers. Mm. And this is a really important lesson, this idea that when you don't earn your leadership position, you create yes people because you don't know how to act as a leader and they don't know how to act around you. We see this often in the corporate world. Just yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Whatever you say is perfect. Yes, 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 yes. Titles. And those people, you see that with titles, with somebody with a vice president. I was a vice president for years. And so you see that just because of the title, people yeah. want to please you because of your, you're a prince, right? You're a vice you're president. A prince. Right? Yeah. 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 And you haven't maybe, you know, a lot of people with those titles haven't necessarily earned it. Earn leadership creates believers. If mm. I can see that path to leadership that you've taken, you have credibility in my eyes. I will follow you wherever you go. I'll listen to you. I will take your advice because I've seen that you've earned that position. And it's such a huge difference. And we, we see both of these types of leaders in the corporate world. And I want to mention one more thing about that when it comes to employee retention. If I can see a path to leadership, I'm likely to stick around a little bit more. But if everybody at leadership position hasn't earned it, then I'm going to start looking around and thinking, how am I supposed to get there? I can't see how these people have earned their leadership position. There's no way for me to do it. I'm going to go find a different place with a, with a better path. Wow. Yeah, that's... You saw all that in that movie. Yeah. Well, actually, I saw it just from when you think of garbage, think of Akeem. That was like yeah. what kind of set me off on that path. All right. Yeah. One of my favorite lines from that movie is uh, uh, when <laughs> when uh, um, Eddie Murphy says, good, good morning, my neighbors. And he gets the response <laughs> from, from the Queens. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you go on Instagram and you go on Instagram Reels and you type in, good morning, my neighbors. Yeah. There's so many people that have done that with their cups of coffee in places all over the world. It's great. I know. I know. I I, I do it often when we're on vacation. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think only my wife laughs. So <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So um, uh, sticking with Eddie Murphy, uh, what about um, uh, Billy Ray Valentine in Trading uh, Places? What do we learn there? Yeah, another great um, unexpected kind of leadership character. Billy Ray Valentine, we meet him in Trading Places, not to get too deep into the plot. I would just, if you haven't seen the movie, please go see it. It's, it's or please watch it. It's Eddie Murphy, Dan Aykroyd, J Jamie Lee Curtis. It's just a fantastic movie. Yeah. 
uh, way ahead of its time. Great comedy, but way ahead of its time. And what it was talking about was society as well. And so Billy Ray Valentine, he plays this con man on the street, but he's super smart. And I won't tell you how he gets into this job as a commodities broker, but he does end up in this job and he's never done it before. And the night before his first day as a commodities broker, he's really, really nervous. Now we all know he can do this job. We know it. We all know he's smart enough, but he's talking to the Butler Coleman and he says, Coleman, what if I can't do this job? What if I'm not what they expected? Mm. And Coleman says, just be yourself, sir. They can't take that away from you. Oh. Now, if that was the only lesson to just be yourself, that's an important one. And the breakfast club teaches us a really valuable lesson about just being yourself, but it goes deeper than that. And it's this idea we talk about today about imposter syndrome. You may have heard that, that buzzword. I'm not a big buzzword fan, but I do like imposter syndrome because it does speak to people who have earned a position, but they don't feel like they deserve it. They're not sure. Why me? Why do I have this position? How come I'm the one who, who got this job mm. or have been promoted to this position? I think it's a really important thing to question yourself. And I say this from this idea of a Billy Ray Valentine, he's questioning himself. And I say that confident people question themselves, arrogant, arrogant people question others. Mm. And I look at uh, Billy Ray Valentine, I, we know that he's smart enough. I, I believe he believes he's smart enough, but he's still questioning himself. Because when you stop questioning yourself, A, you stop growing. When you stop questioning yourself and say, you know, every time I, I get on stage when I'm doing keynote speaking, I think, am I going to be good enough? Are they really going to like me? That whole Sally Fields, you yeah, really, really yeah. like me? You know, am I, are, are they really going to like me? Am I going to do a good job? Are people going to feel like, yes, this was worth it to have him here as our keynote speaker? I'm constantly questioning myself. Once you start questioning yourself, where are you going to go? You're going to start questioning others. And unfortunately, we see this a lot in corporate leadership today. That, that circular firing squad that we talk about where everybody's kind of questioning each other, pointing fingers. So if you're questioning yourself, just you're doing the right thing. It means that you are a confident person. You're questioning yourself. Confident people question themselves. Arrogant people question others. Mm, I love it. I love it. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I saw it in my time. And, and imposter syndrome is something we've talked about on this show is it's my one thing I, I've struggled with throughout my career. Like, how did I end up here and why? You know, and, and I do keynote speeches too, and I feel the same way. Like, why, you know, how are they going to walk away from this? And, you know, how, how, why me? And, 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 and how, how can I teach them something that they're going to walk away and, and remember, you know? And uh, so, but I think you're right. I think it's, it's this idea of, 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 of confident people are questioning themselves. You know, can, how can I, you know, make sure that they're, they're effective and they're good at what they do. So I like that. Yeah. And then once you stop questioning yourself, there's only one place to go and it's start questioning yeah. other people. Yeah. Uh, and that never ends well. No, it doesn't end well. I've seen that time and time again. So, yeah. So, um, so let's switch gears a little bit to Prince, you know, he was a, you know, musician, pop culture icon. Um, I, I was surprised to see that there's leadership lessons in Prince and that's the, yeah. that, that one really surprised me. This is a great one. I love this story. I get so excited to tell it because I love Prince, the musician, just in general, like we talk yeah. about Michael Jackson being the king of pop. Um, but Prince was the king of music. If, if this was 1987, the story I'm going to share with you was in 1987. He was he had been on the scene for what seven or eight years, maybe nine years. He still had another 29 years with us. Mm -hmm. He was just getting started, but he was already being nominated for Academy Awards, winning Grammys, writing music for wrote Shaka Khan for Shaka Khan, the the uh, Manic Monday for the Bangles. You know, he was oh, writing wow. music for people, yeah, and playing instruments and doing his own thing. Uh, so. Prince, 1987, Suzanne Vega was an alt singer. And I knew of her because I listened to college radio. Uh, also, she had a song called Left of Center on the Pretty in Pink soundtrack. And then she came out with a song called My Name is Luca. Mm, oh, yeah. uh, I live on the yeah. second floor. I live upstairs from you. Yeah. It's a really serious song about child abuse. It brings up, you know, really, really important social issues. Uh, but she was not somebody that was a household name and, and Prince obviously was. Well, Prince heard her song, this, my name is Luca. He was so moved by it that he actually penned a handwritten note to her. And it says, dear Suzanne, Luca's is the most compelling piece of music I've heard in a long time. There are no words to tell you all the things I feel when I hear it. I thank God for you, Prince. Mm. And he, he penned this handwritten note to her. It's pretty awesome. And you can Google it. If you Google Prince and Suzanne Vega, it'll come up. You'll see the handwritten note. His handwriting is as magical as you would imagine it to be. Uh, yeah, and yeah. just incredible. So 
well, let's think about this for a second. He takes the time to write, to pen this handwritten note. 1987, can't get it to her through email. There's nothing digital here. There has to be an extra step. Somebody has to get this handwritten note or whether it's Prince himself or someone in his entourage or has to put it in the mail, but she gets it. How do we know? In 2016, when, she, when he passed away, she put it out on her social media for everybody to see, to know the kind of guy that Prince was behind the scenes because he would never tell people this. He would never say, look what I did. So she puts it out there to let people know who, who he was behind the scenes. And he taught us a couple things there about leadership. Number one was that leaders share the stage of success. So here's Prince on the biggest stage in the world, proverbially and literally the biggest stage in the world. And he saw somebody else doing something great. And he said, hey, greatness, I see you over there. There's room on this stage for you. He was willing to bring her up on that stage, you know, proverbially, I always struggle with that word, but you know, uh, <laughs> he brought her up on that stage and said, you're doing great things too. Uh, rulers keep everybody below the stage. Yep. They don't want everybody up there. We talked about the unearned and earned leaders. It's the same type of thing. They keep everybody below it. No, no, no. Can't share the stage with me. Why? Because they probably haven't earned that stage. He had earned it. And now he wanted to share it. Leaders share the stage of success. Number two, encouragement doesn't cost a thing. You think mm -hmm. that that handwritten note didn't encourage Suzanne Vega, that didn't give her a boost of self-confidence? Oh, yeah, yeah. Think about the person in your life that you respect the most in your career and in your industry, and they took the time to deliver a handwritten note to you because oh, yeah. they saw you doing something great. That's pretty awesome. Uh, we can all do that. Encouragement doesn't cost a thing. And the handwritten note is a lost art. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, it really is. Now it's powerful. I, I was mentioning uh, when we got started, I was teaching a session on leadership at, at North Carolina State University to grad students this morning. And I tell when I when I talk to grad students, I tell the story of a boss that encouraged me. Uh, and this was, you know, this is 30 well, 35 years ago, and I'm still telling this story to college students. It's it's in my books because yeah. that one leader encouraged me at a time where I was down uh, because of a failure that happened at a test lab. And and he picked me up and he gave me a new direction and and gave me encouragement. And uh, and like you said, it's free and and it's still impacting me decades later. And I'm still telling that story decades later. So yeah, that's a great lesson from that. And I had no idea about that story. So thank you for sharing that. That's a, That's an excellent one. I love it. Yeah. Look it up. Prince and Suzanne Vega. You'll see the note. It's pretty. Ah, so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, so what are some other lessons? We, we've hit a lot and, and I know your books are full of them. So any, any other ones that stand out that you want, you know, want to share? Yeah. I actually want to talk about, uh, I don't know how much time we have left roughly. Yeah. We've got about five minutes or so. Okay, yeah. cool. So I'll touch on dead poet society. Okay. So dead poet society, John Keating played by one of my favorites, Robin Williams. And I'll say that I love pop culture, if I'm being honest, there there aren't a lot of um, people in pop culture who pass away where I'm. I feel like I'm impacted. Like I felt like mm. I had an investment in them, and they had an investment in me, even though I never met them. And Robin Williams was one. Uh, John Candy was another. Mm. Uh, Chris Farley and Prince. I mean, these are four that I think they they they, they passed away way before their time. Yeah. And uh, so Robin Williams was one that really had a huge impact on me. And he plays John Keating, this high school, this professor in this elite boarding school in Dead Poet Society. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. Just be in the right mood for it. This is not your typical like happy-go-lucky 80s movie. Yeah. Uh, you have to be in the right mood for it. So he's talking to the kids at this elite boarding school. And we, I think we all know the Carpe Diem sees the day. That's what everybody tends to pull from Dead Poet Society. But there's something bigger that he says. He, sa he says to them at one point, no matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. And this is a really important moment in the movie. Now, back in the 80s, uh, if I wanted my words and ideas to get out to the world, I had the Community Times newspaper in my little town. Yep. Maybe 20 people were going to read it. Now, in the palm of our hand, we have the great equalizer. You don't have to be an athlete, an entertainer, a politician, a world leader, a journalist to get your words and ideas out to the world. You can do it right now. You can go on your phone, on your, your phone, your computer, and you can get your words and ideas out to the world in a second. It's so important. And that's, that's talking the talk. But you have to walk the walk as well. What are you going to do to take action? The words are great, but what are you going to do to take action? And so for me, it's animal rescue. Mm. Animal rescue is near and dear to my heart, always has been. I grew up in a family. My grandmother was way ahead of her time doing animal rescue back in the you know 50s and 60s and 70s, well before it was kind of you know the thing that people did. And so I grew up around rescues and shelters, uh, and, and I have a rescue pit of my own. His name is Bodie. We talked about him earlier. 
uh, Bodie boy, I call him Bodie. He's named after Patrick Swayze's character in Point Break, um, which is a fantastic <laughs> '90s movie. Yes. Uh, but I love Patrick Swayze. I mean, really incredible, incredible character, and there's some great documentaries on the guy. So uh, Bodie, so Bodie was basically dead on the street at three months old. He was paralyzed. He couldn't go to the bathroom. A couple of cops found him. They scooped him up. They took him to this rescue that I follow. It took him a month to learn how to walk. Um, he got up and walking. And just to tell a quick story about him, I got him at six months old from the foster after he was, you know, rehabbed. And I got him in August of 2020. Little did I know that I was going to need this guy as much as he needed me. Because in March of 2021, my, my girlfriend had been with me for a long time. I knew she was going to leave at some point. I was very supportive of her moving on to do something else in her life. She bought an RV and she took off across the country. She lives in the coast of Oregon now, I think. Uh, and she's doing great and she's very happy. But she, you know, it was a huge hole in my life. She left. Uh, three weeks, about a month later, my, mo- my, my stepmom got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer suddenly and passed away three weeks mm-hmm. later. Then my mom died of Alzheimer's in July of 2021. Oh so all within a 120 day period, I had some pretty significant life events. All along, I had this guy with me, Bodie. And no matter how down I was, he picked me up. And I feel like they know in a lot of ways, they, they can feel your energy and your emotions and they feed off of that. And he really is just this happy, positive, happy-go-lucky dog. And so I say that rescued is the best breed and it really is. And uh, I think it's so important to, you know, adopt, don't shop that, that whole kind of slogan that rescued is the best breed. There's so many out there that needs ho- need homes. And I can tell you how much joy Bodie has brought to my life. Oh, outstanding. That's great. That's good. Good message. Good to hear that. And, uh, and a good, uh, good. And it comes from dead poet society too. a little bit less right. there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, this is exciting. We, we really just scratched the surface of all the stories that you have in your book. So tell us how they, how people can find out about all of the books that you have. And you, I know you've got a new one that's just come out. Yeah. Uh, and then how they, how they can find out about your books, your speaking and anything, anything else, any way to get in touch with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. So yes, my third book in the series came out on September 26th. A little bit of a shift. This one is raised on the 80s and it's 30 plus unexpected life lessons from 80s pop culture, from the movies and music. Now, uh, the first two are the workplace lessons. So what 80s pop culture teaches us about today's workplace. You get a little bit of workplace lessons in the third one as well, but it's really much more about life. And there's pictures for me in the 80s. So self-deprecating humor is the best humor. Um, You'll see me in some, some interesting fashion. Uh, and then I have chrisclues.com, C-H-R-I-S-C-L-E-W-S.com. That's where you can find all my information, all of my videos, television interviews, uh, keynote speaking engagements. If you're looking to bring me into your organization, you can go through uh, chrisclues.com. And then also on social media, I'm at, at 80s Pop Culture on Twitter. Can't believe that handle was available. Uh, <laughs> Chris Clues 80s on Instagram. And then you can find me on Chris, Chris Clues on LinkedIn and Facebook. I, I haven't ventured to TikTok quite yet. <laughs> okay. Not sure if I will. Uh, yeah, well, I have, and I'm not sure if I'm, yeah, I don't know. I don't know yeah. what I'm doing yet. So <laughs> I'm a child of the 80s too. And I'm, yeah. TikTok is way beyond me. But uh, well, this is great. This is fantastic. And we'll go ahead and put uh, links in the show notes for all these resources. Chris, Chris, this is really exciting. I think that we, we've we talked about on the show before uh, this idea of learning leadership lessons through stories. And you are doing something very unique. And you've taken these these stories and these icons and these things in, from, from the 80s, these pop culture references from the 80s, and you're pulling those leadership lessons out, these workplace lessons, these life lessons. And that's really powerful. So I commend you for doing something that's very unique. And uh, I really, those listening in, I encourage you to go check out Chris's books. Check out, if you're looking for a keynote speech, uh, why not, Chris? I mean, what an exciting uh, uh, speaker that he would be for your organization. So I'd encourage you to check it out. I encourage you to, to look him up and we'll put those links in the show notes. Chris, thank you for being on the show and thank you for what you're doing. Very unique. And uh, I'm really excited to hear these stories. John, thank you so much. Thank you for your service. And thank you for the megaphone today. I really, really appreciate it. And stay rad, everybody. <laughs> stay rad. I yeah. love it. Thank you again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. 
For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Welcome to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing, where we harmonise your mind, body and soul. I'm Amanda, your sound therapy expert. And I'm Stephen, the curious explorer uncovering the mysteries of sound. Together we explore vibrations, frequencies and the power of sound therapy and tuning forks. Discover ancient wisdom, reduce stress and tune into a healthier life. Subscribe to Tuning Into Sound Wellbeing today. Welcome explorers of the human experience. This is Let's Talk Soul and I'm your host, Claudia Monicelli. We're not afraid of the great mysteries of existence here. Soul versus consciousness, we're on it. Spirituality versus science, we've got that covered too. Join us in navigating these profound topics with wisdom, curiosity, and a dash of audacity. Whether you're a spiritual veteran or just starting your journey, Let's Talk Soul is your passport to the unknown. Let's Talk Soul, diving into the depths of the human spirit. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts.